Now, in the world of science, the one thing constant about science is change. I mean, obviously, certain things, once they're proven beyond the shadow of a doubt, they tend to stick around here. But remember, Neutronian physics were the bee's knees for the longest time until Einstein came along, challenged that, and even changed it in many ways, shapes, and forms. Although Newton, of course, is a great guy. He's a guy who invented, had to go through the process of inventing calculus and thus birthing some of modern physics just to figure out, is the moon also falling? Which is a very good question. You, you need calculus to be able to calculate, no pun intended, the rate at which the moon or heavenly bodies fall, amongst other things. But that's one of the, that was the reason why it was birthed in the first place. But Mars, even Mars, holds the promise of teaching us new things, things that we never thought about, things that uh, might actually change our understanding of the red planet as it is. Case in point, Mars crater points to water and life, question mark. Scientists find evidence of long, dry lake. Now, this may sound like it's no new news, but let me read the actual article to understand why I think this is worth presenting. Photos of an enormous crater on Mars indicate possible underground water, water that could have supported life and still could or could still be doing so. Now, before you think I'm going to start going into, oh, this is the proof of the Greys, this is their secret home base, and blah, 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 no. But microbial life, that's not impossible. That's not a bad thing. There may even be organisms that have developed underground. We found organisms on our own planet that live in inhospitable places. Take the Marianas Trench, for instance. There are uh, things in the Marianas Trench that have adapted to living in near total darkness, and some that I'm sure have developed a, a way of living in total darkness. You have to remember, if, if I'm remembering my facts, marine facts correctly, we've never quite been able to get down to the very bottom of the trench. We know it's there. We can sonar it. We know how far down most of it goes, but in terms of the actual life that lives there. But it's not just that. We have organisms that can live in volcanic lava. We have organisms we've found in Yellowstone that can live in sulfuric acid, for gosh sakes. Acid pools, obviously, where, where things are constantly bubbling and churning, not unlike the primordial soup, if you will, although that's usually a term that uh, us uh, evolutionists hate because it's not entirely accurate. But for the concept of what most people understand pre-life to be versus when we came to be with life, you have a natural process of stirring of chemicals. You have an open air pit in terms of the sulfuric acid where molecules and, and all sorts of chemicals and compounds can get into that acid. And because acid doesn't destroy, it merely rearranges the molecular structure of a given solid, turning it to a liquid, but not actually destroying it. It's, it's like if you unzipped your DNA. I mean, your, your molecules would not necessarily be destroyed. You just couldn't keep your solid form. You would turn into, you'd be the same you, but you'd be a puddle of acid and all of your molecules and parts from the beginning. But the point is, then you've got this bubbling, you've got this churning. It's like, a, it's like nature's, spinning, uh, uh, nature's mixing spoon. And eventually, you're going to find mo microbial life. There's even life that we found through this research that's able to use, uh, what was it? I think it was arsenic, in its DNA and finds a way to live with poisonous DNA itself. I mean, so it's not unthinkable that if there's water, there's a chance that some kind of life has evolved. 
or may have evolved. I'm not making positive assertions here, but I'm saying that, you know, we're, we're, we're constantly questioning that rock we found a few years ago that looked like it was a meteor from Mars that had microbial life. I kind of forget what the detractors have said about the uh, the life other than saying I think it was that it's it's a natural rock formation that mimics the look of microbial life. They might be right. They might not be. But something like this, where we have the the look of what is probably underground water, and where there's water, there's typically life. I mean, obviously, you need extra certain extras. But if things can live in lava, if things can live in sulfuric friggin' acid, if things can adapt themselves to actually use poisons as part of their DNA and live, why can't they live on Mars? You know, but let me finish this article here. Forgive my little rant there. Images taken by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter show a 57-mile-wide McLaughlin crater, which is now dry. It's one of the planet's deepest spots at 1.3 miles. And minerals there indicate upwelling or upwelled groundwater may have formed a lake on a spot some four billion years ago. One other sign of the former lake, per space.com, channels uh, that climb to 1,650 feet up the walls of the crater's east side. Because the surface of the planet is inhospitably cold, scientists are focusing on lower layers in a search for possible life. Earth's underground is home to almost half of its living matter in the form of microbes. And in like fashion, the deep crust has always been the most habitable place on Mars, says the study's head author. Plus, you have to remember, uh, as, as my parting thought here, there's a lake that they're studying in Antarctica, okay? One of the coldest places on Earth, a place that rarely or does not see the kind of sun that we tend to see. And they're finding that this lake seems to be teeming with life, although I need to bone up on that article because I'm just, my mind's constantly being blown by the universe. When we're not finding uh, signs that there's ground, probably underground water on, in Mars, and where there's water and a crust, there can be chances for microbial life. We're finding ice on Mercury, the planet closest to the sun, for those of you who maybe forget there. In one of its craters, it has ice, which still blows my mind. It's like, how can this be this close to the sun and have any kind of ice whatsoever? The universe, life, all of that seems to find a way. And so it's it's very interesting to me, amongst other things, that, that this is something that is is a thing, a thing that is happening. It needs further study. So again, I I or NASA are not trying to make positive assertions, just that the evidence is strongly pointing to this. And certainly, if we're starting to talk about probably putting permanent satellites around Mars as well, more permanent satellites around Mars, and even a permanent person in as a satellite around Mars. And then, of course, we have that reality TV show talking a lot of game about putting two people on Mars, I think, in 2050, something of that, or 2016, I think it was. And then sending more people after that to try to create a Mars colony. You know, a lot is going on there. And if, we're, if we can start to get people there, or if we can start to get actual, like, equipment that's different than what we've got up there, like Curiosity and all of those, stuff that's actually made to just really dig into that uh, crust and to really just open up the planet safely, obviously, and be able to, to scoop up its guts and bring them back here. I think we would at least find that we've got a good case for microbial uh, evolution on another planet which could go miles further to trying to show and to prove that Earth is something different 
but it, we're not necessarily unique. And if things can develop on Mars, there's no way that things are not probably developing on a lot of those Goldilocks planets. Again, does this point to greys and, and reptilians and all that? No. But it does mean that life is finding ways. Life is existing on other planets. And we are not alone on some level. 